Hello and welcome to Sharp HR Career Corner with Karen Sharp Price. This podcast will inform and inspire you in your quest to find the right career path. If you're just starting out, looking to make a change in your field, or transitioning into a new career, then this podcast is for you. We'll be sharing tips and providing resources on topics such as writing resumes, interviewing, using LinkedIn, and networking. We will take a look at different careers, companies, and opportunities. You will hear success stories from professionals in all career paths, and so much more. You will leave this podcast with three key takeaways that you can easily put into practice. Enjoy! Welcome to Sharp HR Career Corner Podcast. Today, our guest is Mike Broderick from Advantage College Planning of Buffalo. Welcome to the podcast, Michael. How are you doing? I'm great, Karen. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I'm really excited about talking to you on this topic, and this is our second go around with a a son uh, heading to college, so it's always good to be refreshed. Um, But let's start the process with your own story, your own career story. How did you get to where you are now and how did you start or where did the idea come from for Advantage College Planning of Buffalo? Sure. Well, again, thanks, Karen. And, you know, my own story in getting involved in this, I've been involved in education for over 20 years. Uh, I have my New York State Superintendent's License. I have my New York State Principal's License. I have my New York State School Counselor's License. Uh, And in 2004, 2005, uh, we hit, you know, the economy hit a little bit of a lull. Uh, People weren't retiring. uh, And I had to find a way because I wasn't getting hired uh, in in local districts uh, for positions. The competition was really, really fierce uh, back then. Uh, a little bit different market now, but uh, you know, back then I, I would easily be going in, applying for a high school guidance counselor job, and you know there would be forty or fifty other people, uh, you know, there for interviews. Uh, it was really becoming pretty cutthroat, and I took the advice of a friend of mine uh, and reached out to a headhunter company called. Uh, Carney Sandow Associates, they're located in Boston, Massachusetts, and they specialize in working with private schools, private, uh, both day school and boarding uh, up in the New England area and across the country. And they have a couple of fairs a year. And I went to one of the hiring fairs. Uh, They still do this. They're really they're really a great company. Uh, And I spent two days interviewing. Uh, for private schools and seeing if my education could be used in private because I wasn't having any luck in public. Well, I got hired as the associate director of admission and the director of financial aid uh, at the Kent School uh, in Kent, Connecticut, and spent you know five years traveling the country and the world meeting with independent educational consultants a profession that I had never even heard of before Uh, and going and meeting with them and selling our program, selling our academic, uh, uh, you know, programming in our school to see if they may have any students that would be a good fit. And, you know, long story short, I kind of filed it away uh, in my mind that that might be something I want to do down the road uh, and something that would maybe even carry me into retirement. Um, And, I started maybe 10 years ago doing this part-time as a side business, working with three or four families a year, helping them navigate the college search and admissions process. And COVID gave me, along with it seems like many other people, uh, an opportunity to reassess and decide. And I decided I wanted to do it now. I wanted to go full-time. And so I've been at this 18 months in a full-time capacity under Advantage College planning. Okay. And, you know, I have kids and I would say that having that help, having that support, it's, it's kind of like people who are looking for jobs and they haven't done it in years. They don't know where to begin. And and having you out there knowing the ropes and the, the st- strategy of the whole thing, 
uh, can cut a lot of time and effort for the families. And I think there's also a little bit of that power struggle between kids and parents. And so they kind of need that third person in there to to kind of tell them what it might be like and and things to consider. So today we're going to talk about all those things because I think even if you don't have kids, you may have um, friends who have kids, you may have um, siblings who have kids, and this information can be used in so many different ways to help students navigate this world of opportunities, just like careers. There's so many more careers out there that exist that didn't exist even 10 years ago. The colleges and the amount of colleges and the differences between the colleges and the size of the colleges, location, like there's just, it goes on and on and on. And for a student who is 17, 18 years old to try to figure this out, it's a big step it's a, it's a huge step. So let's begin. Like, so what should students start? When, when should they start to think about college? At what point would you recommend? You know, great question. I, you know, I have students from eighth grade through 12th grade, really the best time. It's my experience, the best time to start really looking at where, you know, where your student is, you know, what their goals are, what their aspirations are, is really that second semester of their freshman year and that first semester sophomore year. Because you already have a a little bit of an idea as to what type of student that they are, where they may fall in the academic spectrum regarding college. uh, And you have time as as a parent and as a family uh, to kind of get all your ducks in a row. A lot. One of the biggest problems I come across with families is they think they have time, right? And everybody's working and students are all over the place. They're involved in all sorts of after school programming, whether it be sports or art, music, you know, extracurriculars, clubs, uh, you know, maybe jobs. They're, they're all over the place and time gets away from families. And I get phone calls often, you know, that late second semester, junior year, first semester, senior year, Mike, please, can can you help us out? We've done some things. Can you help get us organized and get us through, you know, really the finish line? Uh, And a lot of that and a lot of the angst, anxiety, stress can be avoided if parents get themselves and their student organized that freshman year uh, and begin to have those conversations really yearly after that. So freshman year, get organized, sophomore year, see where you are, you know, look in, look at uh, the student's course plan over, over that four year stretch, revisit it as a sophomore, revisit it as a junior. So that come senior year, that first semester, you're, you're not scrambling. Uh, yeah. to get so much done in a short amount of time. And in, isn't it sort of that first semester senior year that you're ready You're ready to apply? You have to get it your is. applications in. It really is. Uh, you know, normally my students, I want them to have their applications done early to mid-November. Uh, even their regular admission. If we're going to send them out, let's send them out early so that they can be seen, in my opinion, with fresh eyes, right? NYU just uh, released their admissions numbers for this year. They had 140,000 freshman applicants this year. So things are getting much more competitive at that. And we're in a world of rankings and I, I, I don't push rankings, I push fit, and I think most consultants do, Mm -hmm. but they're out there and they're causing a real log jam at your top 25% uh, of schools in the country, right? Your Forbes has their list. Uh, US News and World Report has theirs. Uh, You know, there are lists all over the place. Yeah. And it's creating a lot of problems. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, that freshman or that first semester, senior year, 
really should be the pinnacle of your student's academic high school career, right? They have been building, keep the gas pedal down. They're taking their most challenging courses. You wanna have as much done with this process as possible going into that senior year because things get busy really fast. Yeah, yeah. So looking back, um, junior seniors, do they, when they're looking at colleges, how important is it to have a degree in mind that you're aiming towards to get into a college? Not as important as you think, Karen. I, I think it's, I have students in, in I think I, this is not unique. I think when it comes to guidance counselors or other consultants, you have students that have for a long time wanted to do one thing or another, right? They wanted to go into law. They want to go in, uh, they're, they're, they're passionate about writing, right? Uh, they they want to go pre-med, right? These are things that they've had in their mind for a long time. And I, I encourage that. Uh, if it's there and it's clear and everybody's on the same page, we ride that. Uh, but if they're if they're not clear, if they're not if they're not if they're if they're not sure about what they want to study, there is nothing wrong with applying undecided. And how we approach that is we look at best fit schools, right? Uh, and we kind of cut them up into a pot. Like if you could picture a pie, there are four real areas of fit. There's academic fit, of course. There's uh, social and cultural, which is kind of the same piece of the pie. There's uh, geographic fit. And then there's, which is incredibly important, financial fit. And of course, that's the least talked about. I'm sure we'll talk about that uh, yeah. a little bit later. But those, the size of each piece is different for each student, right? Some are very, very interested in the academic piece, and that piece will be bigger on the pie, and the financial piece might be smaller, or the geographic piece might be smaller, right? And that social fit, oh, they want the, the whole Greek experience, so the Greek and social piece might be larger. Mm -hmm. So we look... It, it, it fit first, try to find a, a, and create a list. I often give personality assessments and interest inventories to drive conversation uh, so that we can kind of figure out what drives the student, what interests the student. And then each of the colleges on their list should have two, maybe three potential areas of study on their campuses that a student could see themselves learning more about. And then finally, when they're on campus, talk with people on campus, talk with faculty, talk with students in the programs, and then make a decision their sophomore year, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And do you, uh, I don't, there's probably not a statistic um out there clearly, but do you find that most students that even think, oh, I know exactly what I want to do when they get in there after a couple semesters, they decide, eh, this is not what I was thinking and this is not what I want to do. Well, that exact statistic, I don't want to make one up. I don't know the exact <laughs> statistic, but there are yeah. some troubling statistics out there, Karen, that are, uh, that are starting uh, to, to gain some attention uh and they're not talked about often for, you know one of one of them is you know we have a 40 percent dropout rate in the u.s right students wow. going to college it's not the right fit they get frustrated they drop out right it, it leads into partially what's going on with our uh, student loan crisis right students dropping out not being able to pay back their loans right away yeah, uh, because they have to start working and they kind of shuffle their life around and it, it, it really creates a, a bit of a problem. You know, a third of students transfer at least once during their time in college, oh. right? Oh. And it, so that shows that we're not doing a really great job 
the system isn't doing a really great job when it comes to proper fit. Yeah, right. absolutely. And yeah. students change their majors an average of three times in the U.S. Wow. So all of a sudden, that four-year degree, it's taking five, five and a half, right, just to get that bachelor's degree. Yeah. Right? So I don't push students. I don't think it's a great idea to really uh, push them to to make a decision mm -hmm. on an area of study. I think sitting back, talking to them, putting together a list based on all sorts of interests and in, in, in in you know based on fit and just making sure that there are a couple areas of interest at those campuses uh that that would be of interest to the students when they get there they can really dive in look around uh and then make a decision yeah absolutely that help that would help clear up those statistics yeah i can't believe that 40 percent drop out that's a yeah that's a very it's high number it's not talked about often. I, I, I oh. think it's something that's not want, people don't want to really take a look at. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's a troubling number. It's frustrating. Yeah. I think it's frustrating for the system. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's certainly not guidance counselors fault. Uh, they are overburdened uh, with their duties. Uh, they would love to spend all sorts of individual time mm -hmm. with students during this process, but they can't. They yeah. just you know, the national average is about 45 minutes per student uh, yeah. on college guidance. And it's it's not nearly enough. No, it really falls back to the parent. They really have to open it up and help the student learn about different opportunities. I remember my first one when, when they started, um, any career path that they were thinking about, I didn't care what it was, um, I found somebody that was in it doing it and i had them do an informational interview with them just to get an idea of the day-to-day -day and you know the basics um and that that took that list of careers and really brought it down narrowed it um to just a couple because of the conversations and so i think as parents we we need to do more of that because years ago if your father was a salesman, then there's a great chance that you would grow up and you would be a salesman. If your doc if your father was a doctor or your mother was a lawyer, you grew up in that world and you sort of aim that way. But in this day and age, if you can think of a career that you would like to do and it doesn't even exist, you pretty much can make that happen, which is unheard of. Like uh, no one had those options. I remember interviewing my grandmother-in-law. She was a hundred years old. And when she went to college, she had three choices. She got a pick between three. Um, yeah. Sometimes that makes it easier for sure. an 18 year old that has to decide what they want to do. Okay. Three choices. <laughs> I can pick out of that. But when you have literally hundreds of options. How does an 18 year old know? How, how do they know? They don't, they don't. So um, keeping the way that you do that by looking at a few options, not zeroing in on any one of those, but making sure that that school has those things covered so that you don't necessarily have to transfer. You can stay within because you've built friends. You've, you've gotten comfortable with the landscape of, of the campus. Um, giving that student the ability to pivot at the same place is honestly very, very helpful. Um, Cause that can you be got it. It, it is. It's the, that's the best approach. Uh, yeah, it's, absolutely. it's discussed pretty routinely. Like the, the world of independent college consulting uh, is relatively small, but it has grown astronomically over the last mm -hmm. 20 years. Uh, you know, there are certain, you know, states that don't allocate funding for guidance counselors. So there are states out there that don't have guidance counselors. And in those states, you saw your first independent consultants, and it's grown since then, huh. right? Even private schools don't often have a college consultant mm -hmm. or a college counselor on campus, right? They have guidance counselors. and. Yeah. You know, it is a specialty niche area. You know, families are, you know, they, they could easily, 
be investing upwards of $100,000 plus. Easy. Right? I, I talked to a family this morning about Fordham. I mean, Fordham is over $90,000 a year. It, it's, it's, it's crazy. And what we're starting to see as a result of that is a real focus on return on investment. Yeah. Right? So we talk a lot about it. What is the return on investment for a four-year degree out of any particular institution? Because not all of them are created equal. Right. Uh, you know, we're lucky here in New York. Uh, in a lot of ways, the SUNY system is good, and I believe getting better. Their facilities certainly are getting better. Uh, and the return on investment is comparatively large. Yeah. in comparison to a lot of other schools. Oh, absolutely. And I I know and just with my own my own kids, my own sons, they they are more money conscious, which I'm thrilled with. So when they were looking or the first one was looking at schools, he did not want to come out with debt. And I you know, you don't find too many students that are even thinking about that. They'll, they'll deal with it later. <laughs> Very true. It'll, yes. And, and I think one of the things that you said, you really, that return on investment, whatever that degree is, when you go out and get that job, can you pay that debt down? Will, will you ever be able to pay that debt down? And that is something that I don't think is talked about enough because I know that when your seniors in school and they start sharing where they're going. And there's a little bit of an issue with students because they want to say they're going to the Fordham or to the MIT or to the whatever, um, but it wouldn't be a good fit. But, but the name carries a lot. And so they don't want to say that they're starting out at a lower school. Sure. Um, and there's that peer pressure. Sure. And it's also perceived value, right? It, it's, it's, it's interesting. The more I do this, you know, Boston college is a wonderful diploma, but if you're in Boston, everybody has a Boston college diploma, right? It's a big deal for us because they're relatively rare around here, right? They, yeah. There's not as many, right? There's not as many from, uh, from Penn state. Mm -hmm. But if you go to Pennsylvania, there are tons, right? So yeah. a lot of this is a perception of value. Yeah. Um, it, you can easily, and I think one of the things we push quite hard is that it's what you do when you get to campus that is the value, mm -hmm. right? It, it, we beat up on our local schools because they're in our backyard, right? It, it, it's unfortunate. It, it's not the right way to approach it. Uh, Buffalo State is incredibly deep with their programming. There are all sorts of avenues uh, and things that you can take advantage of study-wise uh, from Buffalo State and go off to have a very, very uh, fulfilling uh, and successful career in whatever it is you choose. Uh, and, and not have a lot of debt. And not, and oftentimes not have any, yeah. right? It, it's yeah. just... It's, and it's, I'm glad we're kind of talking about this because it kind of leads into, you know, a, a little bit into that financial conversation that is oftentimes very uncomfortable uh, for families to sit down and have, mm -hmm. but it is incredibly important to have it early and to revisit it every year of high school. Yeah. Right. What are what what can the family unit afford? Right. What are the expectations? Are, is it, are, is the family going to front half the cost, and will the student be on uh, be on the hook for the other half? Right. Is it is it sixty forty? Right. It's important to have those conversations because I've seen this. I've seen families say, oh, don't worry about it. You just get in, we'll figure it out. You just keep working, working, do work real hard, get in the best school you can, we'll figure it out. The child works really hard, gets into that dream school, and then the bill comes. 
right? And even worse, they get in early decision, which means they're locked in. Yeah. And the, the, the parents never had the conversation and everybody's stuck. And all of a sudden, a very uncomfortable phone call has to take place or an uncomfortable, really uncomfortable conversation with the student has to take place saying, we're, we're, we can't do it. Yeah. And I've seen it. And there's yeah. nothing worse than going through this whole process, getting into that, that wonderful school that, that fits, you know, all the, it checks all the boxes. It's a dream to turn around and have to say to that student, no, it, it's just not in the cards. Yeah. You can avoid that, having that, un, it is, it's an uncomfortable conversation, but having it early and having it often. So that yeah. it's less uncomfortable. Yeah. I, you know, like from a, from a career coach's perspective, we were talking about the big name schools and how that looks on your resume. Yes, I believe that, there is a certain network within those colleges and the people that go there, their are families that belong that have gone there. You know, there is that. And I, I'm not going to argue that, but once you get that first job, your college degree gets put down to the bottom of your resume because now it's all about your experience. What internships have you done? What kind of job do you have you had? How long have you been there? You know, what have your accomplishments been at that place? Not they're just looking to make sure, yeah, you have the degree. Okay. Mm -hmm. But so so for most of I think the population getting the degree and not having huge debt afterwards is the is the best way to go. There are families that want that connection, want that network. Maybe they have a history of people going to that college. That that's a different thing, and I don't think that that um, the percentage is is higher than everybody else's that are just trying to get the education and be able to pay for it. Because when you graduate, you're going to get a car, got to have insurance, you might have an apartment, you might want to get a house, you might want to get married, and having. $200,000 debt and then trying to start that life. I, I don't know how people are going to do that. It, it's, it's something that we really do have to talk about, you know? Oh, sure. And, and we're seeing it in the end result is being talked about on the news, right? Not having that conversation, you know, starting off in, in, in pretty, you know, substantial debt yeah. and we're defaulting on our loans. Uh, you know, it, it's, we have a rule of thumb as consultants that you really, of course, not all debt is bad in, in, in educational mm -hmm. debt. There's a return on, on, on that. Uh, and it's cheap generally to, to borrow. It's some of the cheapest money that you'll ever borrow. Mm -hmm. The way we look at it is you don't want to borrow more over four years than you would make as a uh, as a new employee in the first year of your area of career, hmm. right? So if you're a teacher and you make sixty, you know, fifty five thousand dollars a year, you don't really want to borrow too much more than that over four years of a bachelor's degree. Yeah, that right? makes it's common a, sense. It's a good. It, based on a lot of talk and based on mm -hmm. a lot of uh, a, a lot of uh, number crunching, yeah, that's been the that's the rule of thumb that most consultants use, and and that makes it makes sense. And you know, things are just only going to cost more. And and you, we all want our children to be better off than we are, but it's expensive out there and in not just college, but in just living. And so you don't want them to always be behind the eight ball trying to get out of debt. Cause it's just a, you know, it affects so many other things, health relationships. It just, you know, goes on and on and on. So, so we all know college is, can be very expensive. Um, but there are scholarships out there these days how do students even learn about them? Because from what I gather, there's a lot more out there than we even know. 
And there's a lot of money sitting there that might not even go out to students because there's not a, enough people applying. And, and so how does a student who really wants to go somewhere, and maybe it's not even a tie to a school, but um, how, how do they start that process of scholarships to see if, if maybe they can get some help? Great question. The, the most successful student family groups that, I, that I've worked with have prioritized the scholarship search, the finding money search, almost to the point where they see it as a job for the student. All right. So they, you know, instead of the, you know, that junior uh, going out and getting a job at, at the local pizza place or, you know, ice cream shop and doing, you know, eight hours a week or 10 hours a week, they're putting that towards scholarship search because based on the conversations that I and consultants have with the family, it's really trying to get the student to understand that it is real money, yeah. right? It, it's not make-believe, it's real. And it, it goes to, you may not see it right away, you may not see the benefits of it right away, but they are real. And the best way to look for them is locally, you've got to be able to, you, you got to look over, under some rocks. Uh, and what I mean by that is you're going to find them in some very, especially locally, some very weird places that you may not have considered looking. Your local rotary, your local library, mm -hmm. right? Your local chamber of commerce, right? Your, uh, uh, if your, your parents are working, there may be a scholarship available right through their employer. Right. There might be some uh, some some social scholarships from social groups in the area. Uh, you just have to get aggressive. And look, and just because it's five hundred dollars a year. Don't look down your nose at it. It's it's another. You know, it's another dollar amount that you can throw into your bucket if you if you win it. Yeah. Right. So yeah. you start you start locally. You have your student go into their guidance office. There's normally a filing system of local scholarships that get updated routinely. All right. Guidance again, they don't necessarily have the time to walk you through it, but you can go in and start working your way through, read them. They'll be normally in flyer form. Uh, in document form, see which ones you may qualify for uh, and begin to work your way through those applications. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also do online searches. There are some local engines and there are some national engines. Like Niche.com is, 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 is a great resource uh, that you can find regional and local, uh, local regional and national scholarships. And then I start working my way out. I look for regionals. I look for nationals. The problem with national level scholarships, like Pepsi scholarships or you know Ford Motor Company scholarships, is they receive a ton of applicants, mm -hmm. right? So your best bet and the best bang for your buck is is your locals okay. and trying to find you know if if a student's been a Boy Scout or a Girl Scout and trying to find if there's if there are scholarships available in those areas, or if, you know, if they're interested in the STEM field, right? Maybe, you know, Moog has a scholarship or, or, or Tesla uh, going on. In, but it, it requires time, commitment, and research to do this. There's a great book that I want to share with your listeners. Uh, it's called Confessions of a Scholarship Winner. Oh, Okay, it okay. costs about 15 bucks on Amazon. It's by Christina Ellis. This is a young lady who put herself through Vanderbilt and then on to Belmont. Uh, she won over $500,000 uh, in, in scholarship funding. And she was smart enough to keep all of her notes. She did a fantastic job. It's a great read. I use it with all my students. Wow, that's, that's incredible. Um, it is like a job in itself to do that. When when is the right time for students to start looking for those scholarships? First semester junior year would be a great time to start. 
Okay. Because they constantly get updated. Right. So your your freshman year wouldn't do you a whole lot of good. Your sophomore year, but that that junior year, you can at least start to, you know, earmark which scholarships out there you may qualify for. Mm -hmm. Put them on a list, revisit it your second semester, and then over that summer between your really your junior and your senior year, the scholarships will flip to that application, uh, that application year, okay. right? So if your student is going to be applying for college in 2025, right? That summer between their junior and senior year, they'll, that'll flip over. The newest requirements will, will come out uh, and be updated. You can see if you still, you know, if you still uh, kind of fit the requirements and then begin the application process. Okay. So when we were talking about um, like four areas that when you're looking at colleges, you're looking at degrees or majors, um, interests that you might have, money, location. Um, how important are tours of colleges for students? Oh, very. Very. Yes, Karen. It's in that's something I get on parents early, uh, e e even as early as freshman year, uh, mm -hmm. even if they're not that, even if they just walk a campus, even if they drive a campus, I call them targets of opportunity, especially that, that, that freshman, sophomore year. If you're driving someplace, right, you're going to visit family in Michigan, right? You're going down south for for break uh, for for spring break. You're going to just for a week. Uh, you know, I've had families that normally go to Hilton Head, right? They go mm -hmm. for a week every year. Uh, I have families that, and I tell them, stop at Clemson, right? Stop at the College of Charleston. Walk the campus. Drive the campus. It doesn't it, that early. It doesn't have to yeah. be a formal. Uh, tour uh, mm -hmm. that can come later but the more that they walk them the more the student walks them they can kind of see the differences between you know big research universities small liberal arts colleges small liberal arts colleges that are rural or urban uh small you know big research universities that are rural or urban uh, mm -hmm. they have different feels for each and the okay. more they walk them, the more they put themselves, you know, in those communities, the better picture they're going to have for themselves and the easier it is, it's going to be when it's time to start creating a list. So is it better to do a tour when school is in session than when there's a break? It, it does it matter? You know, for early on, I don't think it, it matters as much as when you start putting that list together. Mm -hmm. then you're going to want to go when the students are are there like that freshman sophomore year yeah you go we're lucky because we have such a, a wide variety here uh in western new york and i even mean you know that it, 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 as far as syracuse right uh, you really can get a wide variety in, in in pretty short trips right there there's just a really good uh a good variety uh, but okay. that freshman, sophomore year, you know, go walk Niagara, go walk the University of Rochester or Brockport, right? Drive down to Geneseo. Uh, but that, based on a lot of that work, it'll help drive your list. And then as you begin to create your list, then you go and you do your formals, right? Okay. Then you call Syracuse and say, listen, we'd like to come uh, in, in schedule, you go online, they have tours all the time, right? Mm -hmm. You go to the, uh, the Colgate website or, you know, you go to uh, Clarkson, right? In, in right online, you can do your, you can schedule your, your visit. Okay. Uh, and they'll even say, do you want to meet with person? Do you want to meet with somebody in missions? Do you not? Right. You, you can kind of click that box uh, so that okay. they're ready for you when you get there. But really that junior year, that's when you really want to do your formals. Okay. All right. Now, there's lots of acronyms out there. So there's TAP, there's FAFSA, there's Excelsior. Um, 
do students and parents have to be bothered with this? Like, what if they have money and maybe they got some scholarships and they think it's, you know, they can pretty much manage it themselves. What are all these things and do they have to be bothered? They do. Yes. I, it, it's important to make sure that you sit with somebody who understands this, whether it be a financial advisor, a college consultant. Guidance is pretty good. Uh, they understand what they all mean. Mm -hmm. But you want to sit down with somebody and work through your FAFSA, right? Uh, the FAFSA it is the document that needs to be worked through so that when it's sent into the government, they formulate what's called the EFC or the estimated family contribution. That's the money that they believe that a family can put towards their child's education per year. Okay. Right. And it's important to be able to, you want to do it, whether you think you're going to qualify for aid for, for financial aid or need-based aid, you're going to want to do it because even if you apply often for scholarships or private scholarships on campus or you know school scholarships, uh, they're going to want to take a look at those numbers. They want to mm. see what's going on with the family, right? Okay. Uh, it, it's not going to necessarily uh, impact whether a student gets a scholarship or not but they want to get an idea as to what's going on with the family financial, right? Okay. And there's what's also called the CSS, prof uh, the CSS profile, which is a profile that you're going to want to fill out uh, per school. I think you'll really only have to fill it out once and it can get sent to multiple schools. Uh, it will, it's a bit more detailed financial report uh, and is used primarily for private scholarships. Oh, okay. Full day scholarships. Okay. And then Excelsior just is for New York State. Um, it is. Did they increase that amount every year or does it pretty much stay stable? Well, it's been changing over the last few years. Uh, it's evolved. Um, and I think parents should apply for it because there's different levels uh, that you can receive awards, right? If, if you, as a family, you make such and such, you can receive this award. If you make this much, you can receive this award. Uh, there's, you know, there are varying levels uh, of award being offered, offered through Excelsior. It's a great program, uh, very easy to apply, uh, very easy to find online. All you have to do is Google uh, Excelsior scholarship, and it will take you directly where you need to go and walk you through it. Um, but never assume that you're not going to qualify. Have oh. them say no. Okay. Now, if you, if you, um, have it and then you lose it for a year, can you get it back? Or once it's gone, it's gone. Which, which, which are we talking uh, about? The Excelsior? Um, do you know if, I don't know, and I don't. I I believe you can, but I'd have to dig into that and, and get back to you on that. Okay. Uh, but I um, believe so because you apply for it every year. Okay. So so tell us more about your services. What what do you provide? Um, and when should students start making appointments to talk with you? Well, again, we work with families from eighth grade through senior. Uh, we offer multiple packages. They're all length-based packages, right? So my my uh, eighth and ninth graders, it's a you know, 20, 30-hour package where we help the family kind of get organized, get used to the language. Uh, we help start putting together a, a long-term academic plan based on their child's uh, high school academic profile, right? What's available at the school? Right, what should they be taking as a freshman that will make them appealing? How does that roll into sophomore, junior, senior? It helps lower anxiety, uh, right? To have a plan yeah. going in uh, to your freshman year. So that's one plan. There's another plan, which is really for uh, nine, uh, I would say first semester sophomores through first semester juniors. 
it's a larger plan. Uh, if they sign on during that, they would sign on during that time and I would take them through the application process uh, through clicking send and having the applications go off. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's probably a 40 hour package. If, if someone's working with me from their first semester, sophomore year through their senior year, that's a lot of hours. We meet yeah. monthly for about an hour every month. And then I would say they're May, June, going into their senior year, we would switch over to two times a month. Okay. Through the application season. Okay. Right. And what we do is, you know, we help them with general admissions guidance. We show the student and the parent what they're going to, what they're going to be seeing, what they should be doing as sophomores, what should they be doing as juniors, what they should be doing as seniors, even after the applications are sent. There are some things that they should be monitoring and doing. Uh, if the student is accepted, that's great. Uh, if they're denied, there's not much you can do if you're flat out denied. If you happen to be placed on a wait list or a deferment list, there are some strategies out there that may increase your odds of getting taken off those lists. Uh, so we work with families through that, right? So it's application guidance, whether it be the common application there are still a, a few schools out there that have their own application, uh, mm -hmm. Georgetown being one of them. They don't use the common application. Most do. Uh -huh. There are a couple of systems, uh, the California University System and the California State System uh, do not use the common application. They have their own application system. The State University of New York has their own common application or the student can use the common application. We figure it all out, we get them organized and we work them through those applications. Uh, we do a lot of college essay support, uh, right? So my juniors huge. right now, yeah. I, I mean, that's, it, it's, a lot, it's time consuming. Uh, it takes a lot of time to go through them, to put them through yeah. the wash to get the students used to writing that way. Uh, my juniors right now are on their second and third prompts, uh, wow. right? So they're going through because uh, the college board has seen fit to use the same prompts uh, on the common application for the third year in a row. That's on oh, wow. They've never done that before. I think oh. COVID is playing into that a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. So there hasn't been a change but we're taking advantage of it. So my students are already writing rough drafts. We'll go through them uh, multiple times so that when it's time to click send, they're very confident uh, wow. in their language. Uh, now we don't change their language. Um, I want, because so many schools have gone test optional and that's kind of become a little less important, mm -hmm. something had to fill that void something had to become a higher standard. That's mm -hmm. become the essay. It's, it's really the lone time that a student can speak directly to admissions personnel. Ah, okay. Everything else is data up to that point. Right, right. Right, wow. so that essay is very important. So we help them with that. Help, we help them build their list based on those areas of fit we discussed earlier. Uh -huh. uh, you know, financial aid research. Uh, you know, we, I don't sit down with financial documents and work them and walk them through the FAFSA. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not qualified to do that. I'm not a financial advisor mm -hmm. uh, that should be taken to a professional, mm -hmm. uh, but I can certainly, uh, you know, go in depth in regards to scholarship. Where should we be looking, right? Where can we find them? What, what there's all sorts of platforms I can share with the family so that they can do their own research. A student can do their research. Uh, and then we do standardized testing in, in course planning, in high school course planning. Hmm. When should they take their PSAT, right? When should they take their SAT? I have my students generally, I encourage them to take both the SAT and the ACT, right? Because... Yeah. Colleges don't care which score you send in. Right. 
and the tests are different. Some school, some students do better on one than the other. Mm -hmm. So there's really, there's no reason not to take both. Right, right. So if a family is listening and, and they really think that you could really direct them and just save them time and effort and give them the path, because that's, that is worth, you know, it's weight in gold so that you're not scrambling to try to figure out what to do next and when is something due and what is the next strategy. Um, what is your contact information? How can people reach out and, and get in touch with oh, you? Absolutely, Karen. And, and you're right. We are. We're, we're project managers. Uh, that's really what we yeah. do. We, we get them organized. Parents don't have to worry so much because we're meeting with them monthly to make sure they're hitting, uh, you know, certain, uh, you know, uh, checkpoints along uh, along the process. Mm -hmm. uh, if they'd like to get in touch with me, they can reach out. Uh, it's my name, Mike Broderick, at advcp.com. Or they can contact me uh, at my office number, which is 716-473-1557. Again, that's 716 473 one five five seven, and I'll include that um, in the notes of the podcast so that they can also see it. Um, and I'm sure that they can also find you on LinkedIn as well, so they can reach out that way. Please so, at at the end of the podcast, I always like to ask my um, guests to to share three pieces of advice. And so, what tips could you leave high school students and their parents right now um, who are thinking about college, but they're not sure that they can afford it. Um, what tips would you give them? Well, the, 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 the biggest tips I can give family is don't wait. Start early. Uh, don't let this process play you, play the system, right? Get, get aggressive, dive in, uh, do your research. It's not, hard, it, it seems hard to do, and it seems a little bit complicated, but colleges have gone partially is because of COVID. Uh, they've really gone above and beyond to make access to information easy and clear for families. Uh, their admissions websites are far more easy to follow now than I think ever before. Mm. Uh, there are informational opportunities both on campus and via Zoom, uh, I think we can. I think we can thank COVID for that, uh, so that they can sit down and listen uh, to uh, webinars being offered by uh, college admissions. Jump in early uh, so that the process and the language becomes easier and easier and easier to understand. Yeah. I, That's I, one. Um, yeah. The other is to get on campuses and ask questions. Hmm. And, you know, lastly, don't be swayed by rank. I, I think we get, you know, rankings are here. It, we're, we're, we're sometimes we kind of get ourselves locked up in rank, right? Your Forbes, your U.S. News World Report, we talked about those earlier. Hmm. Uh, they're there. Uh, the big names, just because a student gets into Brown doesn't mean it's going to be the best fit for the student. Uh, I, I've had, I've heard plenty of horror stories of students going off to that big name school, realizing it's just not a personality fit. It's not a cultural fit and they're miserable. Uh, and it, it can happen as easily at one of those schools as it can uh, in, in a school that you may not, uh, you know, know of off the top of your head. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think you should look at schools, uh, you know, don't, don't dismiss them uh, because they don't necessarily have the money to, to have a huge reach, right? Canisius College is a great school. There's all sorts of great programming there, but they're a regional liberal arts school. They don't have a huge, they don't have unlimited money uh, to go, you know, across country and market. Uh, but that shouldn't diminish, that doesn't diminish uh, their value as an educational institution. Yeah, 
Yeah, I totally agree. Well, Mike, you have given us so much to th think about. And in, in a path to strategically set your student up, your child up, um, for success in, in this process, because it is a process to figure this whole thing out. And, and it seems overwhelming. Um, I also find that there are a lot of students out there that are first time in their families going to college. And so they may not have parents to ask questions about their experiences because their parents didn't go to college. And so coming to an organization like yourself who can kind of guide them and, and give them what's the real things that they need to focus on and, and kind of, you know, just clear that pathway for them is, is absolutely huge. It, it just can help people um, figure this, this thing out. Uh, and it's, it's something that, you know, it lasts four years or more. So you've got undergrad, more students now than ever before are going on to get their master's. Um, and then even on further than that for law, for med, medical school, for all these different things. So it's, it's a process that, you know, you just don't do it once. You have to do it for a number of years in the future and getting your foot in the right door to know what that process is the, in the beginning is key to, to help you along the Absolutely. way. So thank you so much for all this information. I, I really, um, I appreciate all the time that you've spent today giving us this. Oh, absolutely, Karen. I really appreciate you uh, inviting me. Uh, I hope, you know, your listeners, uh, I hope they get a lot out of it or got a, got a lot out of it today. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I wish them success in this process. Um, and we're, we're always available. Thank you again. Really appreciate your time. If you enjoy Sharp HR Career Corner podcasts and I would be honored if you would leave a review wherever you listen to it. Reviews help us be seen by more people. So thank you in advance. Until next time, be kind, everyone. We need to show a lot more kindness in the world, and it starts with you and I. Thanks for listening, and have a great day. <laughs>